Good evening, everyone. Hi. Welcome. I am just totally an hour behind. Lots of drama. Um, it must be the Independence Day holiday, take a break kind of thing. But one thing with the work of the Lord, you can't take a break. You know, break taken. Time running out and things got to be done. So there will be no breaks. But it's good to be with you this evening. And my apologies for the starting time. I'm still having a lot of location issues and setup drama. So let's just get started. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for another opportunity to look into your word. Thank you for the day that's gone before us. Thank you for keeping us safe and for bringing us to this point. We pray, O oh God, that as we look into your word, you would be glorified and that something that's said would be bring glory to your name and give us more clarity on what it is to be with you and in you and to work with you and for you to work through us for your glory. We pray, O oh God, that you would be glorified in everything we do and say in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Good to be with you. My apologies once again. So sorry. <laughs> Just a lot of location issues. I hope I can get it sorted out finally very soon. So this evening's topic is the God that never fails. The God that never fails. Okay, we have often heard the quotation poise that what would you do? The question, somebody would ask the question, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? What would you attempt to do if you knew that failure was not an option? You could not fail. This has to, this must succeed. This will succeed if I did it. What would you attempt? What would you try? What of which of your goals would you follow through on? There are always a myriad of answers when you ask that question. Some answers are, I'd open a business, I'd go back to college to get that degree, I'll run for political office. There's an option in this political season. Run for political office. Some people would say I'd get married. Some would make an investment in the stock market. And the list goes on and on and on of things that people would like to do. We as humans would like to do. But because of different, you know, hesitations and pause and second guesses and all that we don't do it why because we feel that we will fail I'm not sure I'm gonna win on this one so let me just sit this one out so many of our dreams and aspirations we wouldn't dare pursue them why because of fear doubt unbelief we hear every day um, questions do you know how much it costs to open a business for those who might be thinking of opening a business you know how much it costs to open a business? And, and then said, I'm too old to go to college. Or, and I have kids too, can't go to college no more. And no one would vote for me. If I ran for political office, nobody would vote for me. And for marriage, they said, marriage don't work anymore, so what's the point in getting married? And they say, you can't trust anybody these days. And for the stock, stock market, they'll say the stock market is too volatile, it's too up and down. I'm not sure I'm, if I put my money in, I may not get it out. So, so many things that we think about doing or have aspirations of doing, but we never get around to it because of fear and disbelief. But if our God never fails, then we can't fail. So there are certain things that he's placed in our hearts to do. And if we do them, he is with us because that's what he promised. And we always stay in the current state that we're in because we, we, we stay there, we're unfulfilled, we're dissatisfied, we're disillusioned, but we're not going to move because to move is to, so to speak, take a chance. We'll have to take a chance on something that we're not sure of, so we're not moving at all. And this is just as true in the world as it is in the body of Christ in church circles, in the Christian, in Christendom. We know certain things we don't do, and what, no? That's because we don't think God is with us. Because he, we don't think he is on that train with us, so we're not taking the ride. Isaiah 41, 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So here's God saying to us, fear not, I am with you. I am with you. So 
fear not. Go forward and do what it is in your heart to do because I am with you. And if God cannot fail, we cannot fail. And what do we do? We read this passage of scripture day, day in, day after day, Sunday after Sunday. We read other scriptures that encourage us, fear not, go forward, do the things in your heart, and stuff. but we remain paralyzed in the state that we're in. We don't move forward. No, we don't move forward. If we truly believe that God is with us, there's no goal or dream that we would not attempt to achieve because God is with me and he's the God that cannot fail. So we should move forward and we'll be successful and achieve those goals and dreams because God is with us. However, there's one truth that we often fail to consider when we think of goals and dreams. There's a certain aspect of this whole thought that we need to think through carefully and that is the truth that any created thing has a manufacturer, has a creator, has someone that created it. Every created thing has a creator or a manufacturer. And only the manufacturer, only the manufacturer can really give the full details of the purpose for his creation. He can give the full details of what I created this for, what I created it to do. Consider this. How many times have we bought a piece of appliance or um, a kid device and instead of reading the manual properly, we bought it. We either use it incorrectly or we fail to get some of the benefits from it. All its capabilities and stuff, we don't use any, hardly any of them. We just use it for one thing. Let's say like a cell phone. We only use it to make calls. We use it for nothing else and it can do a thousand different things but we use it for one thing. I only need to make calls. So, and think, um, simply because we do not consult the creator, mind of the creator. We do that, we use one feature out of the thousands because we do not consult the mind of the creator. And where do we find the mind of the creator? Where do we find the mind of the creator? We read the instructions of the creator. The manual, that's where the mind of the manufacturer is, in the manual. But who's reading that long, boring, fine print document? Just to understand how they operate a toaster? I had a hundred toasters and I know how to use a toaster. I don't need to read no manual to know how to read a toaster. So what do we do? We burn up a couple slices of toast because we're not used to the gears and the, and the guides on it. So we burn up a couple, couple slices of bread and we think, oh, nothing to it. I just lose a couple of slices of bread because I would not read the manual. So we do not read the manual and we burn up the toast and we move on. And while we can do this with gadgets and um, instruments and appliances, while we can do that with them, we cannot afford to do that with our lives. We cannot afford to play games like that with our lives because one of them burn toast could be something really, really bad. So we cannot roll the dice with those kind of things. A $25 toaster, sure. But our lives, we cannot afford to do that. We cannot afford to. because And because God never fails, we'll never fail. But we cannot roll the dice with our lives. We have to go to the manual of the manufacturer. Who's the manufacturer? Our manufacturer is God. He created us. He's the creator. So if he created us, now we have to go back to his manual, which is the Bible. And we go back to the Bible and find out what exactly is it that he created me to do. How do I find out? The Bible will tell you how to find out what it is God sent you here to do. Because the desires are already in your heart. Proverbs 19.21 says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that still stands. That shall stand. The counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Oh, don't worry about all the devices in a man's heart. We got all kind of bright ideas and fancy notions and stuff. But the, the mind of the Lord, that will stand. The counsel of the Lord, that will stand. Don't worry about what all we're thinking about. Go back to the manufacturer to get the instructions for our lives. What is the scripture saying to us? It's saying that we have many dreams. 
many goals, many aspirations in our hearts. But when all is said and done, only the things that, that Jehovah has ordained will stand forever. The things that will stand forever or benefit us most in the long run is the counsel of the Lord, the word of God. What he says about our lives, that will benefit us in the long run. Where do we find the counsel of the Lord? In his instructions book, in his manual, in the Bible. As we look around, we see many persons moving aimlessly through life. No aim, no objective, just living one day, next day, day after that, day after that, doing whatever they feel like. No guideline, no structure, no plans, no nothing. Just living day to day to day. They have no their awareness whatsoever that every moment of every day we spend on this earth is important. They don't see it that way. They feel like you just live till you die and that's it. But every moment of every day that we live on this planet is important. What we do with those moments is vitally important. Many waste their lives either goofing off and doing nothing or pursuing goals and dreams many of which they have zero gifting or talent for. They don't have the gifts or talents for it, but they are pursuing it with all their might. Because while we are all born with gifts and talents and co that come naturally, gifts and talents come naturally, we just do it, it's sweatless, it's effortless, we just do it and it, we enjoy doing it too, if it's a gift or a talent. Many of us become distracted at an early age, distracted from the things that we really love to do. You see a little boy that likes to build stuff with his hands, but his parents tell him, go to, go to college and become a doctor. But all his life as a little boy, you see him putting things together to build and to make. He probably would have done better in construction or something like that. But no, see, from his heart, from what he was doing as a child, you can tell which direction he's going in. But we sometimes parents shift them in another direction and it puts them on a totally different path. Sometimes the parents' objective is to steer us in the direction that would equip us for that successful career. That successful career. It does not matter. You don't really like interacting with people. It don't matter if you don't like interacting with people. You must become a doctor. Why? Because that's where the money is at become a doctor. Money isn't being a doctor. But doctors must deal with people. Doctors must deal with patients. So if you don't really like dealing with people, you're going to be quite miserable. Sounds like a miserable life. Because now you have to deal with people every day and you don't particularly care about dealing with people. But now you have to deal with people because it is now time for you to serve your customers, your clients, your patients. And you have to see them one after the other, day in, day out, all day long. And then you go home, you're tired, miserable. Because I don't particularly like dealing with people. But you have to deal with them because they are your customers. And this is the life that you chose. Think about people who have spent half their lives climbing a ladder, a corporate ladder, towards a particular goal or career. Just to get to the top, to find themselves lonely and miserable. Lonely and miserable. But if we allow God to take control, He will direct us toward the career path that He has ordained for us. And because He never fails, we will never fail. But we have to be directed by Him. Our lives have to be, must be directed by Him. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not evil, and not evil, to give you an expected end. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. As this, as this scripture indicates, Jehovah has an expected um, end for our lives. He has a plan. He has expectations for our lives. An expected end, an end goal. He has one for each of our lives. Many of us will, sh will be shocked when we stand before Jehovah and he reveals to us the full scape of his original plan for our lives. 
Some of us are born with the ability to accomplish amazing athletics feats. We can do amazing things in athletics. Some can sketch beautiful artworks, maybe even captivate an, an audience with speech or with song or with singing. And sometimes we are so far from those goals. Some people, you hear them on the side of the street singing or singing somewhere and you're like, wow, you can really sing. And they never sing for a crowd in their life. And they love it. They love doing it. But they're probably a rocket scientist. Really? You don't even love what you do. You love singing. But here you are, a rocket science. so, scientist. So we need to pay attention to those things in us that we love to do. Because that's what Jehovah does. When he creates us, he creates us with a love for a particular skill or goal or gifting. And if we don't pursue that, we pursue something else. We're now trying to force, let's say, a square peg into a round hole. We're now trying to fit in somewhere where we really don't fit. And what do we do? Spend all our lives chipping away at the edges to make sure that square peg fit in that round hole. So we're trying to re what do you call it, reinvent the wheel. We're trying to remake something that Jehovah has already created perfect. We don't want it that way. We want something else. Because sometimes these talents do not bring us immediate reward. What we do? We cast them aside and go after careers and agendas for which we have no passion. None. Don't like people. But you're a doctor and you see people all day long. Miserable. What is so wonderful, what I love most, most about Jehovah is because he created us. He has already placed within us the desire and passion for the purpose for which he created us. He creates us with the desire and passion for, the, for whatever goal, aspiration he's created us to obtain. We already have a desire for it. So we need to look within ourselves and see what brings us joy. Whatever brings us joy, more than likely that's what create, Je Jehovah created us to do. But what do we do? We fight against it. That don't make no money, so mm -mm. Mm -mm. I don't want to do that. That don't make no money. So we fight against it and we live miserable lives. And what happens? Jehovah is the God that never fails. But because we don't follow his plan, we fail. And then what do we say? Life's not fair. Yeah. Jehovah's fail-proof plan is what he puts in us already. We were born with it. He gives it to us at birth, at creation, when we are formed in our mother's wombs. He knits into us all the desires and aspirations that he has created within us. And if we follow those, we will live happy lives, joyful lives. He cannot fail. Jehovah cannot fail. If we follow his blueprint, we cannot fail. But many times when we are engaged in those activities that we are gifted to do, we ask ourselves, is this work? Because, you know, sometimes if you really love doing something, and it's, it's, it's easy to see in, like, baseball and basketball, sports, a lot of sports, sporting events. Because if somebody is great at basketball and they love basketball, you're like, this is work? Yes, that's work. But you enjoy it so much, it's not really work for you. So it continues to bring joy to our lives because that's what he created us to do. Psalms 37, 23 to 24 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholded him with his hand. When we seek the Lord and allow him to order our steps, the scripture says that we will find delight. Delight is joy and happiness. When we allow Jehovah to guide us to the path, the career path, that desire and that goal that he has ordained for our lives, we find delight. The, the, the journey will be delightful. Our journey will be delightful. But don't overlook the fact that it also indicates a fall or a problem. What does it say? Though he fall, it talks about falling or failing or things going wrong at some point. But what is the scripture encouraging us to say? Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him by his hand, with his hand. 
so that even though you fall, the Lord is right there to lift you up. Why? God doesn't fail, so you cannot fail. You cannot utterly fail. There will be problems, there will be issues, there will be up times and down times, but you will not fail. You will not fail. And that's what we don't, we don't want to hear about the failing. We don't want to hear about the falling. Normally, if there's a difficulty or a stress that we can see in the process of what we're looking towards, if we're looking towards a goal and it looks like the money ain't going to be enough or you don't make enough money or such and such, you just don't go straight all the time. There's a possibility of a fall here and there. Even though we know in our hearts that's the desire that we love to do, that we want to do, that we desire to do, we don't follow that. We leave it alone and back away from it because we're afraid. And we don't realize that that's Jehovah's plan for our life and we need to step towards it. But we don't want none of that. But we must remember what the opening scripture that I used said, Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So it does not matter if there are difficulties, hardship, pressure. Jehovah says he is with us. He cannot fail, so we cannot fail. But what do we do? We use our tiny carnal minds to try and estimate and evaluate and meditate to see which way is the easiest and quickest way to get to the top. Quickest way to get to the top. We're not even realizing that what we perceive as a smooth path straight shot to our goal could make a sudden turn on a dime life turns on a dime and our goals can turn on a dime and we will find ourselves stranded alone because remember that this is not what jehovah had for you if this is not what jehovah had for you then there's going to be a problem and we can expect we can't expect his assistance if we don't go the way he is guiding us we must follow his path Proverbs 3 verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Remember, he is not directing your path if you do not trust in him. If you don't trust him, he is not directing your path. If you are leaning on your own understanding, making your own decision based on your own limited observation, then you, he's not directing your path. We may be able to see to the corner. We can see to the corner, but once the corner turns, we can't see any further. Jehovah can see to the corner, around the corner, and all the way to the end of our lives. So we need to trust him to guide us and to direct our path. Psalms 90 verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We must pay attention to how we are spending our days. What are we doing? Some of us, our lives are like a rocking chair. We are making a whole lot of motion, a whole lot of motion, but we are not making any progress. We are making a whole lot of motion, but not much progress. Some not any progress. It's time to pause and take a look over our lives. It's time to ask ourselves some tough questions. It's time for us to get a pen and paper and sit down and write down the things that we have changed in our lives in order to bring positive results. What things have I changed in my life to bring me some positive results? If I haven't changed anything and all I'm getting is negative results, we need to look at that and start making some changes. Ask the question, what changes have I made this year within this year. What are the changes I've made within this year to bring my life more in line with Jehovah's will? What have I done? What are some of the things that I've done to bring my life more in line with the will of Jehovah? Acts 10 38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. God was with him. He could not fail because God does not fail. He's the God that does not fail. And Jehovah was with Jesus doing good. 
You might say you cannot heal the sick or raise the dead or cast out demon, but it says that Jesus was doing good. Who went about doing good? All of us can do good. What is the good that you're doing? What are the positive things that you're doing? Think about it. Write them down. What are the positive things I'm doing? What are the, some of the things I've changed from negative to positive to move my life in a positive direction? Here are some suggestions. Number one, spend more time in prayer and Bible study to get yourself more connected to Jehovah. Set aside a specific time and place for it. Don't just let it happen by accident. Set aside a time and a place for prayer and Bible study. I can't begin to tell you what a wonderful change it will make in your life. That was my first step. When I really got serious about seeking Jehovah and moving away from going to church, the church ritual, just going to church, being a Christian, following the rules, when I decided and realized that Jehovah wanted a relationship, not just religion, not just doing things religiously out of habit over and over and over again, but he wants a relationship. When I realized that, then I started to do things differently. If you're going to have a relationship with someone, you must spend time. You must get more acquainted. You must get to know the person better and better. And so you have to make those decisions, those changes. Number two, invest some time in the lives of others. Don't always be investing in your own life. Invest some time in the lives of other people, family members, relatives, friends. Sometimes we spend time with people who do not benefit our lives. We spend a lot of time with people who don't bring no benefit to our lives. They subtract from our lives. Sometimes we call them friends, but they are really enablers. They're not friends. They're not friends. They're enablers. Enablers. They encourage us to do destructive things, involve in destructive behaviors, waste time around We waste time around these people because they do not challenge us to do better. We love being around them. They don't challenge us to do better. We just do foolishness together. We just gossip together. We just go around and do just waste time together. So we love being around them. Instead, they encourage us to do negative things, negative habits, negative practices. We need to move away from those, move away from those relationships. And before we know it, years and years and years have passed and there's been no positive change in your life. Suggestion is a suggestion. If you know an older person or you have older parents that you don't live with, visit with them. That's a very good investment in the life of another person. Older people are lonely. They don't have much people around them. So spend as much time as you can with older relatives. You can go to their home or you can decide to visit the old folks home and sit with the older person and just talk to them for a couple minutes. These are the kind of investments that really enrich our lives. They value our company. How much time do we spend with people who really couldn't care less whether, whether we're there or not? But older people, they really, they really love it when we visit with them. So when you think of investing in the lives of others, think of in, um, visit, visiting with an older person or a handicapped person or someone that's sick. That's a good investment of your time. Number three, Ask Jehovah to show you what he created you to do. What he sent you to this planet to do. Don't just soak up time and use up time and waste time and goof off. Ask, ask him. He'll tell you. Ask him, what did he send you here to do? What are you supposed to do with the gifts and talents that he's given you? Some of us don't even know what those gifts and talents are. So ask him. What are the gifts and talents that you've given me? And how are you requiring that I use them? Because he requires that we use them. And like I said, when we stand before him, we will give an account for the fact that he gave us gifts and talents and all kind of, all kind of things in our lives. And we just didn't even bother to look at them, look them over, go through them, expand them, enhance them. We do nothing with them, bury them. But... Like I say, remember that God never fails. God never fails. And no matter what the goals, what goal the goal is, no matter how impossible it seems, just remember that God never fails. And if God never fails, we cannot fail. So God bless you, bless you. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Let me close and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. 
Thank you for all that we've been able to accomplish in this day. Thank you for the session that's gone forth, Lord. I pray that we would take that moment and look over our lives and see what exactly did Jehovah send me here to do. And Lord, we would get busy doing it. As we go to bed tonight, Lord, I pray that you grant us sweet sleep, guide us, keep us, and help us to rise in the morning to give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. It's a pleasure being with you. Like I always say, you could have been doing anything else, but you decided to spend these moments with me. God bless you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.